you are what you are. And when it came to football, I was, and, and still am to a lesser degree now, hey man, it's all about business when you cross those lines. When I come off the field, I want to have a good time, have fun. When it gets on the field, it's all business. I lived in Williamson County a pretty good number of years. My family goes back history really to 1905. Uh, my grandmother was born here. Uh, my grandfather, uh, who her name was Ethel Clark, well, Ethel McMillan. She married my grandfather, who was Earl Clark, and uh, we called her Nanny. She lived to be uh, 100 years old. So she saw, you talk about monumental growth and history and whatever of this county, man, it's unreal. She used to sit around telling me the stories. Just, I was stay at her house a pretty good bit. Uh, my granddaddy, uh, of course, he uh, knew a lot of folks around this area. Because uh, it wasn't like it is today. You know, it, it was rural, uh, very rural. And, you know, he used to go coon hunting and all kind of hunting. We would fish together. We would, you know, I'd just be a little kid being his grandson, doing following your granddad. And... Uh, uh, his son, William Howard Clark, and my mother uh, was Mary Margaret Clark, who was Mary Margaret Marley, married my dad. Uh, they lived here in Franklin for a lot of years. And uh, it's for, from my daddy's side now, he was from La Mesa, Texas. And if you've ever been to La Mesa, Texas, which I, re I really doubt it, if they ever faked a moonshot, there it is, <laughs> at La Mesa. Well, from my understanding now, uh, of course, the Franklin Rodeo, and I would think everyone now would know about the Franklin Rodeo, but back in, I, wanna, I believe it was 1962, I may be wrong about that, but it's you know, pretty close to that time frame. Uh, uh, the Rotary Club, and they were trying to get something going you know, pretty big for, for the town, et cetera, et cetera, and they had some folks get together and, and got the rodeo going. Well, the second year of that thing, uh, Daddy won the uh, all-around cowboy. Uh, for that uh, for that rodeo, and uh, he and uh, Preston folks, John folks, uh, Dr. Harry Guffey, who's also kin to us, uh, uh, and it's, so it's really strong roots here in the, in this county. Now we didn't always live in this county because Daddy moved around to different places, uh, working horse and cattle operations. Uh, we lived in uh, West Tennessee for X amount of years. Perrier, Como, Gleason, and then we went from there to uh, Indiana uh, for just a little bit, another huge uh, horse and cattle operation. Then we went down to Bolivar. Uh, I, I guess I was in seventh grade, or somewhere in that time frame, and there was another big uh, horse and cattle operation down there. It's called the Old Lenore Stock Farm between Bolivar and Middleton. And so if, if you went between Bolivar and Middleton, hung a right, and you got off in that swamp down there, that Hatchie River bottom, that's where we were. <laughs> we didn't see anybody in the summertime, man, we didn't nobody. I couldn't wait to get football practice. <laughs> I'd get to practice, and those guys come like, man, it's hot. And I said, well, man, why don't you come over here with me for a week and see, <laughs> see what you think about it. So we did that deal, and eventually we moved back to Franklin. All right, Kingfield. Uh, now, I'm going off memory now, so I may be a little sketchy, but I think I'm going to be pretty close. Uh, it's, uh, you go to Leaper's Fork, and at the time, Leaper's Fork wasn't like Leaper's Fork is today. You know, Puckett's Grocery was out there. There was a hamburger place right across from uh, Puckett's Grocery. And Puckett's Grocery, it was a grocery. We used to eat rag bologna and cheese and, you know, go in there and, get you an RC Cola and peanuts or something. It, it was a grocery store. Mm -hmm. We would go up and then uh, take a right, next, and we'd go right by Hillsborough School. Uh, and I won't say it was like an elementary, probably 
K through eight or whatever, I, that I don't know, but I, it was Hillsboro School, and we would weave and wind, and, and finally we're in Kingsville, up on top of the hill there, and our house was down in the hollow uh, where we lived, and uh, it was uh, owned uh, at one time by Felice and Boodle O'Brien, you know, they wrote Rocky Top and Z and other songs, at least that's what I was told. And uh, so we're in, that was Kingfield. And uh, also, we would ride across the hollow, uh, Waddell Hollow is what, what, not the only name I ever knew. And uh, we would go across and work horses and cattle and do whatever. And then right around the bend from our house, uh, there was Mr. Blevins, and I believe he owned the Jiffy Pop popcorn, at least that's what I was told. And we would go over there and, you know, work as horses and that type deal. And we were probably out there, you know, a couple of years. I can't tell you the exact frame, but a couple of years. Uh, then we came back closer into town uh, and we're out on Clovercroft Road, mm -hmm. which is, you know, headed toward 96 out uh, Murfreesboro Way. And, and at the time, the only thing that was out there was a golf station and Shoney's. Really? That's it. So man, hey, you want to go eating high cotton, son? You're going to Shoney's. So we, you know, every once in a while we got to go to Shoney's, and and uh, we would go to uh, uh, Gulf Station. Of course, obviously that's where you got gas. If you, you know, that's it. And there was nothing on Clovercroft Road as far as houses and things, you know, as there are today. Uh, we, we moved. Of course, I, I went on to Franklin High and played there from you know, 10th, 11th, and 12th, that was high school back in there. Freshman didn't go. And then from there I went to UT Martin, we'll talk about that later. But uh, I stayed at my grandmother's and my grandfather's place, you know, pretty good bit, which they lived on 4th Avenue North in, in a rock house at 1939, is from what I understand, like basically they just dug up rocks and built a house. You know, they built it and that's where they lived and had an, like an old apartment in the back, and uh, you know I spent a lot of time obviously over there uh, with them, uh, and uh, eventually we lived in those apartments back there for X amount of time. It's how much again? It's a long time, a little hazy. X amount of time, uh, but uh, so to say we have strong roots, I'd probably be an understatement as far as the older type uh, Franklin uh, deal. Now the teams that we played in high school, we were in what was it called the old NIL, Nashville Interscholastic League. And we played like Maplewood, McGavick, Overton, Stratford, uh, school like that. And then out of the league, I remember we played like Dixon County, Columbia, you know, school, schools like uh, Mount Juliet, Hendersonville, but they were all towns. They weren't just like <laughs> all Nashville back then. Uh, we had some guys that would, would get after it. Uh, we did that, uh, a guy named Tim Barrett. Tim had opportunity to play in that, at, at that time out at Oklahoma, you know, that's during the Switzer years and all that, and, uh, which, you know, they were just killing people. Dom, they, you know, ranked number one in the nation, whatever. He went to Vanderbilt. Uh, we had a guy named Chuck Lanier who uh, played uh, fullback. He was a really good player. Uh, Butch Burnett, who went on, he won a state wrestling championship. He was a really good player. Uh, and, and, and a guy named Zippy Brown, he wound up playing at Morton. And a matter of fact, uh, Johnny Gentry played uh, center and linebacker, you know, with multiple positions. There were seven of us that uh, went on, if I was kind of, there were seven of us that eventually went on and played in college, which, you know, that's pretty good. Uh, especially off of, of the high school thing. Now, at different levels, but uh, so, and then again, we're playing somebody else and they had the same thing. So it's just like bang, 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 you know, that type of deal right there. So, it, and some of the hardest hitting games I ever played in, and uh, I'm talking in college, when we played like Dixon County in Columbia. Really? Man, oh, man. It was, Did man. Did you win those games? Well, we won some of them and we did win some of them. It was, but, yeah. Uh, we won the body count sometimes, and sometimes we didn't. Cause, I mean, because of course back in that era is totally different. You may throw it twice, and those two passes were in warm-ups. It was just like wham, just ramming the ball, you know. 
So, uh, you know, we were getting after it. Well, I was a quarterback, a tailback, uh, defensive back. I was a punter, uh, punt returner, kick returner, you know, that, that, type, of, that type of deal. Yeah, Coach Dalton, Ray Dalton, uh, if it hadn't been for that man, I don't know where I'd be sitting, but I sure wouldn't be sitting right here talking to you. No way. He's a great example of what one person who takes the time and takes an interest in a kid, how he can change that kid's life. He changed mine. And, and here's how. Uh, you know, I'd been through all that and whatever, and, you know, I'm not, you know, I wasn't the greatest student in the world. I'm just sort of slacking by and whatever. Now, when it came to sports, I was football, wrestling, and baseball uh, is what I did back then. And uh, had a good career and did the all-state thing and all that in football and was third in the state in wrestling and uh, playing baseball. I was, I was a better baseball player than any of them. But uh, he took time. He said, look, this is my senior year. I graduated early out of high school uh, back then. You know, like most kids do now that, that sign, they'll go ahead and leave early. That, that's, that's just the norm to go into spring practice. Well, back then, that was not the norm. Uh, it's very rarely done. And that's not me saying it now. It's looking back because I coached in college in that era too. So uh, he, he worked it out where I could go to Martin. Uh, and Coach George McIntyre, who many people in, in uh, Middle Tennessee will know, because he was the head coach at Vanderbilt for a lot, lot of years, coached down at uh, Ole Miss and different places. And his son, Mike, is the head coach at uh, Colorado right now. We, uh, and <laughs> Mike was about 10. We used to throw him down the mud all the time, roll him around. That's a different story, too. But uh, he worked, uh, Coach Dalton worked it out with uh, Coach McIntyre. So I went up there. And back in those days, you didn't have a – hour limit like now it's like 20 hours a week etc cetera, etc cetera. then it's like 20 hours a day, a day or it felt like it so we went through a month and i had in my mind if, if i didn't scholarship out i'm going to the marines i didn't tell mama that but that's what my plan was well i uh i scholarshiped out and uh well from that point on i uh got my education uh Made lifelong friends, great lifelong friends. Had a really good career playing football. And uh, it was a springboard to what I'm doing now. You know, I got into coaching and found out that, you know, that, that wasn't what I wanted to do. That wasn't my job. That was my calling. That was my passion. And if it hadn't been for him, that wouldn't have happened. So I don't care what the sport, what business, what you do, you can make the difference in somebody's life by just taking an interest in them. And I'm not, it, 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 and it's not like we didn't bump heads because we were a lot alike. You know, we, he was a demanding guy. My daddy was a demanding guy. So I was used to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking about you're going to do it this way all the time, every time, and that's it. Fine with me, because that's what I was brought up. So I didn't have any problem with that. But you... We're all in the same business. What would you think that business would be? Well, here's what I think it is. We're in the people business. Because we all work with people. You know, unless you're, I guess, digging for gold up in the Arctic somewhere. where you, you know, We're in the people business. So you deal with people. But, uh, and what I found through growing up, growing up here in Williamson County, uh, growing up on those horse and cattle operations, uh, hey, we weren't brought up easy, and I'm glad of it now. Because when things come up, there's not a day that goes by in my life that I don't draw off something that I learned playing football or I learned out there working those horses and cattle. Not one day t today. There's not one thing, one day that goes by that I, that I don't draw off of something, whether it's mental, physical, emotional toughness, respect uh, for others, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Coach Dalton had a hand in that. My daddy had a hand in that. Now, I, and I'll say this, it took me a while to catch on from my dad because we sort of clashed, mm -hmm. you know, because 
and, and again, I look back, and it's probably because we were a lot alike in a lot of ways. And uh, but the older we got, it everything meshed back together. But I appreciate now the values that I learned back then. Back then, I was just I was doing what I was told. And there's a lot to be said for that. You know, do your job. Sure. Do your job means do what you're told to do. Hey, don't do everybody else's job. Do your job. Everything else take care of itself. So anyway, I learned that type of thing from those people, and it, it served me well throughout, throughout uh, really, not only my career, but throughout my life. Good teaching or great teaching and great coaching are the same. There are three parts of it. And the difference between the people that can do the second and third part, everybody does first and second part. Tell them what to do, teach them how to do it. Every coach, every teacher in America tells a kid what to do and teaches them how to do it. The third part is getting them to do it. That separates the Mickeys from the average coaches. A lot of coaches say, well, I told them what to do. I taught them how to do it. They wouldn't do it. Well, Mickey could get them to do it. The expectation in football is for the position. And if you've got Ray Lewis, then he's going to exceed expectations. But if you don't have a Ray Lewis, if you have a linebacker that's lesser than a Ray Lewis, then he's at least got to fulfill the expectations for the position. And whereas Ray could go from sideline to sideline, the position really just called for C-gap to C-gap. So if Mickey didn't have a guy that could run sideline to sideline, he made sure he had a guy that could do the box, the C to C-gap. So the expectation is for the position. You got to make sure you got the right, don't coach potential, make sure you got the right kids in the right spot. But tell them what to do, teach them how to do it, and then, and then there's something about a great coach that, that becomes, those are scientific, that's a scientific method. Tell them what to do, teach them how to do it. That getting them to do it is an artist. It's just a guy that can motivate, motivate or inspire kids just by his way and his passion for the game. In 1989, uh, I became the head coach of uh, USJ. Uh, they'd never won a playoff game. Uh, so that first year, we won the first playoff game in the history of the school. And then from there, we you know, just built and built. Kids worked hard and did their deal. And you, you don't know what makes you a really good coach? It's really good players. <laughs> you don't win a Kentucky Derby on a mule. So you better have good players and also guys around that can coach those players. And I was always fortunate to uh, have guys that I worked with. I never called them assistant coaches. We were just all coaches. I just had to be the head coach. We uh, were all uh, all good people, good strong character people, and good coaches. Because I just believe this firmly. You better surround yourself with great people. If you don't, you don't have a chance. If you do, you've always got a chance. When, when in the right way okay. and doing everything you can do fundamentally to win the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, and really more than that, it's more than the winning, it's giving it all you got on every play. If you play 100 plays in high school football, which is very, uh, well, common, because we had a lot of guys that were two-way guys, you know? They play more than, they play 110, 112. Every play, 100%, well, when you do that, well, if you win, you lose, then you can live with that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then, then there's something wrong. That's, that's what I'm talking about, more than the winning. And I guarantee you, you turn on any high school film in this country, I don't care who it is, you're going to find some guy out there that's not going 100%. You just are. Mm -hmm. You just are. Well, okay, that's... My goal was to get them all to go. Me too. Always just go and go and go. So it, that's right. Yeah, the winning, and, and I'm all about winning. But more importantly, I'm all about guys giving it all they got every time. Then the rest of it, hey, it's like in those state championship games. Well, we played in five. We didn't win any of them. Okay, I'm Marv Levy of high school football in Tennessee. I have no problem with that for this reason, Okay. I know for a fact, when our guys came off that field, they gave it the best they could give. I know we as coaches, we did the best job that we could do. Now I'm at Trenton Rosenwald Middle School, uh, coaching at the middle school and really like it. Good kids, great school system. We have grandkids that are 11, 9, and 5 who live in Germantown. For folks who don't know, it's about 70 miles from our home. 
Uh, and we had opportunities to go to Florida or Alabama or Mississippi to take some head high school coaching jobs. And uh, sat down and said, that's too far away from my grandson. Uh, we're going to watch those boys grow up. This opportunity took place in uh, Trenton. And so that's where we're at. And it's worked out great. You know, a lot of people tell you, you know, it's about this, it's about that, or whatever. Hey, I love winning. I mean, I'm just going to flat tell you, I love to win. I, I, I despise losing. I always have since I was a little kid. In anything, checkers, it doesn't matter. My brothers and I used to, we call it mumbly pig. I don't know what you do. We would, uh, like me and you standing like this, and we have pocket knives. You know, that's a good thing to have in your five-year-old kid's pocket knife. But we would have it, and we would throw at our feet to see how close you get. You know, this is how you would lose. If you stuck it in his foot, you lost. Well, okay. Well, we competed, and I love to compete. And now down at that level that I'm at now, I love to work with those guys to try to teach them or at least have a part of helping them learn how to compete. And, as long, and again, as long as they do what they are supposed to do, every time they're supposed to do it to the best of their ability, the wins and losses, that'll take care of themselves. You know, if we don't win and they give it their all, then, hey, I can live with that because you can't do any more than what you can do. But, you know, there are most people, most people don't know what they can really do. They got to get somebody to pull it out of them. The big three, okay, the big three, you got to have it, mental, physical, and emotional toughness. I just believe this. And I don't care if it's football, I don't care if it's your business or any business, you better be mentally, physically, and emotionally tough. And, and to me, this is what, what it means. And I'm not talking about in a bully type fashion. I, I'm not talking about that and running over people to get what you want and that type of thing. That's a totally different scenario. And, and we'll get into that later. But what, mental toughness, well, what does that mean? Well, when things go wrong, when things just aren't clicking, what are you going to do? You're just going to whine, complain about it? Or are you going to do something about it? Are you going to learn how to correct it? Are you going to pay attention? You know, th there's a difference between listening to somebody and hearing them. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if you're listening, you're actually absorbing what those people are telling you. You know, hearing them is just like clanging cymbals. There's a big difference between that, listening and hearing. Well, to be tough, well, the way I'm talking about uh, mental, physical, and emotional toughness, well, to be mentally tough, man, you just got to be able to block all that stuff out and bam, be strict focused on what you're doing regardless of what happens. That's what it means to me. Physical toughness is sort of self-explanatory. Uh, you know, there's a difference, in, in, especially in game of football, between being injured and being injury mm -hmm. and hurting. Well, if you're injured, in other words, you know, if you have a, a break, a, an, an obvious ACL, or whatever, you should not and will not be out there if you're, if you're playing for me. A concussion-type situation, uh, it's not happening. I mean, what the medical people, they're trained, what they say goes. Now, being hurt, I'm sore, I'm tired, I'm, my neck's sore, you know, that type. Hey, some people have a problem fighting through that. Well, they better fight through it. They better be fair. Or, or right? they can't play. They're in the wrong game. And not everybody can play football. Well, okay. You're at uh, business. Well, you know, I just don't really feel good today. I don't feel like coming into work. I don't feel like doing it. Well, you know, you don't get feel like doing it uh, too many times. It's going to be like uh, your boss. Well, you know, I don't feel like having you around anymore. You're fired. Mm -hmm. You better be able to suck it up and get through it. Now, if you're actually sick, it's a different story. Well, emotions. Okay. Now, I just truly believe this. One of two things is going to happen with emotions. They're either going to control you or you're going to control your emotions. One of the two. You either control your emotions or your emotions are going to control you. You got to keep it in check, man. You can't just like snap. Because if you do, you're doing nobody any good. You're doing yourself harm. You're doing nobody. You have to control your emotions. You may be as mad as all get out. Well, what? Hey, you got to focus 
step back. You have to handle the situation, whatever that situation is, internally, deal with it, and then move on. The flip side of it is, you're going to let someone else control you. Because people know who's got the switch and who don't, and who can flip that switch and how to flip that switch and whatever. Well, to me, personally, now I'm not say, saying that, you know, here sits the perfect guy because hey, there wasn't but one perfect one. That was Jesus Christ. I ain't the perfect guy, neither is anybody else. But I'll tell you this, I will not let people control my emotions. God, family, and football. Uh, I believe it to be so true and it's, been, it's changed my life so dramatically in my mid-30s. Uh, I wanted nothing to do with Christianity. I just didn't. I mean, yeah, I'd heard it all my life and, you know, been to church some. We didn't go to church a whole lot, but I was football, football, and football. Oh, that's it. I was it. And then when I wound up, got married and had some jewelers, it was some family, football, and football. I did my family a disservice because I was locked on football all the time. I just really was. I mean, I'm sitting there telling you right now, I, and that's wrong. I was wrong. But okay, it happened. Well, in my mid 30s, all right, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes down in West Tennessee, got a guy by the name of Mike Sparks. Uh, and he had uh, been in that area for a long time. He would come by, and, you know, they would say, hey, Mike's coming by. And I said, okay, man, come on in. He'd talk a little bit and I'd be polite, but I'd. Again, the, the listening and hearing part, well, I wasn't listening. I was clang, clang, clang. I'm thinking about doing this over here in football. Then, he, you know, we'd be polite. He'd leave and go on. To make a long story short, he comes one time, and Mike had been coming, and finally I'm thinking, well, man, they just got me surrounded. So I'm, I'm going to listen to what they got to say. I'm not, I'm not going to have the clanging symbols. And I listened. I'm probably 35, 36, you know. And in the back of my mind, th this is what was being told to me as they're speaking. He said, Mickey, you've got two choices and now's the time. There's not going to be another time. This is it. You either listen to these people and take me as your Lord and Savior, or that window is shut. Well, hey, it, you know, it wasn't coming out of the clouds. It wasn't hocus pocus. It, it was there. Okay. So they talk, start to get up and leave and say, no, I'm wait, whoa. Sit back down. I, we got to talk. And it, it, you're talking about shock. You want to talk? Yes. We talked, and right there, I gave my life to the Lord. Right there. And, and my whole life changed right there. Now, I'm not going to say I turned into the perfect person because I, <laughs> hey, ask the guys that played for me, no. Or my wife or Lisa or whoever. You know, I'm, I'm uh, a work in progress. Uh, no question. But from then on, uh, of course, uh, got baptized, and, you know, things just changed. Not really from the football part, because, hey, we were winning before we were winning after. It's not like, hey, you accepted the Lord, you went getting ready to win all these games. No. But it's the way it went about treating guys, uh, treating people, uh, and it wasn't like overnight. It's, as I said, a continuous process. Family is very important to me, obviously, well, we just talked about my grandkids or our, our grandkids, and I'm not going to coach any more high school football. I'm going to stay close to those kids and watch them grow up. Uh, my brothers, man, we're tight-knit. Uh, Mama, all of us, we're, we're tight-knit. Even though, you know, I live further off from them or whatever, man, somebody needs something, they'll call, and before that, that phone's off, bam, we'll be there. Well, getting back to God family football. Well, when that group of guys are together and they're all going through it together, 
They're either going to bond or they're going to split apart. And fall. There's not going to be any in between. They're going to bond or they're going to split. You're going to have complainers, whiners that pull this way and this way, or they're going to bond. Mm -hmm. And really, it's up to the coach. You know, and, and through the years, you, you got to know who's bust, who, what button to push and after you know the kids and whatever. But you're the bonder. You're, you're the gorilla glue. <laughs> you're the bonder. Yeah. And uh, th this is what happened. Uh, of course, I was off from coaching for a year. So I sat down. And I just started typing. Uh, and so what did you start typing? Things that I'd either seen happen, uh, done myself, mulled over, or ever since I've been a little kid, all the way through my coaching career. And there was really no rhyme or reason to why uh, this one came first, this one came second, this one came third. I just started typing. And I would type two or three, and they're short, concise insights, straight to the point. And it's my words. There's lots of ain'ts and can'ts in there. No big words. I can't spell them. I sure don't use them. So it was just straight to the point insights. And after I did a, you know, a few, I said, you know, I'm going to send these to some people that I respect and, and, and get their opinion to see what they think about it. And uh, I said, well, all right. So I kept typing, kept typing. Then I would send it to other people that I respected in different uh industries like in, in West Tennessee, like Gary Taylor, who's big into the construction, uh, Mike McWhorter, who ran for governor, who has a distributorship down there, sent it to Mike. Uh, and uh, they all said the same thing. I said, okay. Uh, James Wilhort, who's a kicking coach, he has a kicking coach uh, clinics all over the United States. And to make a long story short, uh, we looked for, to publish this book. I knew nothing about the publishing business, for, for sure I was a football coach. Well, and it's been about a year and a half process, really. And I'll tell you what, there's, there's more writing the book than writing the book. I learned that for sure. The, the writing was the easy part. So it came together and uh, to become uh, game ready, 52 takeaways for winning. And, and I didn't mean it to be like this, but it's turned out like this and not for me, just cause I'm here pitching a book, it's just different people telling me this, uh, that it fits for any sport, business, or life in general because the takeaways were just like the ones we, we talked about, you know, earlier, you know, mental, physical, emotional toughness. Well, you have to have that in any business if you're going to be successful. Uh, well, handling success, well, you better know how to handle success. What do you do if you fail? Are you going to quit? Are you going to fall? We know things like that. Notice it doesn't say 52 takeaways for losing. <laughs> uh uh. For winning. Well, winning in life. Well, what does winning in life mean for you? It could be something, for, you know, is it financially? Is it physically? Is it spiritually? Is it emotionally? Is it all of that? Is it some of that? I don't know, you know, because I'm not inside you. I don't know what you think. You know what you think. And it all goes back basically to you. And I do know this. Well, I feel this way anyway about the book because I've talked to several people about it and they've purchased it and they've read it and whatever. Uh, it's not about the X's and O's in, of football. I mean, I can get up on a board and we can draw that stuff up all day. It, it's not about that. It's not about, you know, if you're running an off-tackle play, block down, kick out. It's not about that. It, but it, 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 it is about a philosophy that can be about sports. It can be about your business. It can be about your life. It can be about all intertwined. That's what it is in a nutshell. And I would tell our teams this every game. I'd say, you know, boys, you can uh, pretty much bet on it that uh, there's going to come a time when we're going to lose. And they're like, what? I said, yeah, I said that. So there's going to come a time, but it ain't this time and it ain't tonight. We ain't losing. Because I can tell by the look on those guys' faces over there, they don't want none of it. You're better than they are. You're prepared more than they have. You're going to get after it, give it all you got. And I'm just telling you, you've got in you what most don't and will never have. You've got it in you. 
and we as coaches are getting ready to sit back and watch and we pulled it out of you all week. So now it's high school football. It's 48 minutes of getting after it. Give it all you got. Every play. All we want is all you got. Every play. All we want is all you got. And if, I'm going to tell you something now. There better not be one time, not one time, when it's not all you got. Let's go.